Okay, sige po. Start na po tayo. Mamaya po po. Salamat po, Sir Maki. Sir Maki, mag-live na tayo, Sir Maki. Ma'am Jen. So, siguro ma'am, once dumating si Ma'am Sin... ...by of course, the network of uh, Solve Climate by 2030, the Asia-Pacific Rim University, uh, Bard College, uh, the College of Human Ecology, UP Los Baños, Department of Social Development Services, Oscar M. Lopez Center, the Climate Reality Project Philippines, Aquarian I Media, and also we'd like to thank uh, our uh, private um, partner, uh, Rex Publishing. So uh, we'll start uh, in four minutes. So again, thank you very much for spending your time this afternoon uh, to join this webinar. So I am Jennifer Marie Amparo. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. And we'll see you and we'll have a productive webinar for this afternoon. Mag-send na po ako. Pakitry na lang po ulit. Ma'am Jen, i-play ko lang po yung ABP ng UPLB. Okay lang po. Sige po, i-live ko na po. Mag-live na po tayo, ma'am. Okay lang po. Playing the UPLB ABP. Sige po, one moment po. Okay lang po, i-live ko. Tapos... Okay po, we are live already. Students are experts in the field. They enrich it. UPLB feels like home. The warm and friendly people. The professors are experts in the field. They enriching experiences that one gets to enjoy. Learning here is expensive and gives me great value for money. The diverse and the cosmopolitan nature of the graduate community makes me to learn much more in my classes. Apart from being a top university, UPLB also enables me to study so close to nature. The environment is intellectually stimulating and the scenery is refreshing and reinvigorating. One can easily strike a perfect work-life balance studying in UPLB. Don't put the reading for the day. Take a spin around the campus on a bike or hike to the botanic gardens to the gateway to Mount McKinley or take in and experience the beauty and excellence of the Filipino cultural performances and expression. UPLB is found at the foot of Mount Makili Forest Reserve, an ASEAN Heritage Park. This is part of the reason why we have a clean and green campus. UPLB and Mount Makili, which UPLB administers, showcase our commitment to biodiversity conservation. UPLB was the school of choice for me and my friends because we knew it is an excellent university for those who seek a career in science and engineering. UPLB values quality education. Hence, it's actively uh, pursuing quality assurance at both the program and institutional levels. A number of our pioneering and major undergraduate programs have already been certified by the ASEAN University Network Quality Assurance. We have institutionalized new UPLB graduate programs in niche areas that are designed for interdisciplinary collaboration, not only locally, but also internationally. In line with its internationalization efforts, UPLB hosts the only Philippine campus of the Nagoya University Asian Satellite Campuses Institute, where I'm currently undertaking my Doctor of Philosophy in International Development degree. Locally, we've been offering several off-campus graduate programs. We have also established our presence in Panabo City, Davao del Norte in Mindanao, through the UP Professional School for Agriculture and the Environment. I am here to study agriculture in UPLB because I believe I can learn so much in order to help my country. I think that 
when I finish my program and leave UPLB, I'll be better equipped to help solve the food security situation in my country. I am here because UPLB has a very good reputation and offers a course that I'm interested in. I'm taking a PhD in extension education, which is also recognized in my country. What I especially like is that the professors are both academically very competent and supportive. The UPLB programs are relevant because these are based on the realities on the ground and are produced through a carefully thought process combining theory and practice. We champion strong disciplinal and interdisciplinary lens in understanding and providing profound solutions to complex societal problems. UPLB is known for strong research culture that informs instruction and capacity building. The Philippines and the rest of the world is facing complex challenges in food security, biodiversity loss, climate change, uh, public health, and environmental degradation. We in UPLB are always in our toes so that we can prepare and uh, provide the necessary solutions to these challenges by way of our curricular uh, programs. So what are you waiting for? Look up UPLB's 28 undergraduate degree programs or its over 100 graduate degree programs at uplb.edu.ph. File that application for admission and experience what it's like to study in UPLB. So, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Good afternoon to all of us. Um, and welcome to the Solve Climate by 2030 Science and Art for Climate Action, a co-creative process webinar. So, this is being uh, organized and presented to you by uh, multiple partners. We have, of course, the network of the Solve Climate by 2030. We have the Asia Pacific Rim University, Bard College, Department of Social Development Services, College of Human Ecology, UP Los Baños, uh, with partners from Oscar M. Lopez Center, the Climate Reality Project Philippines, Aquarian I Media, and Rex Publishing. So we'll have a productive uh, seminar and webinar for this afternoon. I'm Jennifer Amparo. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. Okay, so I think we could start on time. So. Um, while waiting for our um, one of our uh, one of our key speakers for this afternoon, so we'll start our program by a, um, a, sim a simple prayer and the national anthem. Okay. Let's bow our, bow our heads and provide silence as we offer the silence and prayer to those families and individuals affected by COVID-19 pandemic, of those affected by disasters caused by climate change here in the Philippines, the region, and the globe. We also pray for communities affected by peace and security issues. We pray for peace, safety, and health. Thank you. 
again, good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Amparo, your moderator for this afternoon. So for the welcome remarks, we'll start first with our Chancellor, the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, uh, Dr. Jose B. Camacho. UP Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Maria Cynthia Rose Bautista, to Asia Pacific Rim University's uh, Secretary, General Chris Tremuan, and International Secretariat Director Jackie Wong, to Seoul Climate 2030 Project Director, Dr. Ivan Goldstein, and the co-director, Dr. David Blackstein, and to the new dean of the College of Human Ecology, Dr. Ricardo Sandalo. To our distinguished speakers, Dr. Rudel Lasco, Ms. Nazreen Camille Castro, Mr. Vicente Jaime Villafranca, Ms. Kiri Dalena and the representatives of the youth sector and to all our guests and participants, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar entitled Science and Art for Climate Action, a co-creative process which is being organized by the UPLB College of Human Ecology's Department of Social Development Services in partnership with the Association of Pacific Rim Universities and Bard Colleges Center for Environmental Policy. Today's webinar is part of a global campaign initiated by the U.S. Bard College called Solve Climate by 2030 that has partner universities hosting such webinars to discuss local issues related to climate change and any subsequent local solutions. The webinars and their results are saved and shared and can ideally become the foundation for climate solutions on local, regional, and international levels. Climate action and sustainability are initiatives that have long been an advocacy of UPLB with agriculture, forestry, and natural resource management as our traditional niches, we have become very aware of the increasingly drastic impacts of climate change. We know all too well the economic damages, physical destruction, and unfortunately even the loss of life that come as a result. Part of developing a future-proof UPLB is acknowledging these impacts, accepting that they will occur in the future, preparing for their arrival, and mitigating the damage. We have integrated climate science, disaster risk management, and climate action into our curricula. We have built and nourished a solid body of research and knowledge on disaster risk reduction and management and climate change adaptation, from which we have derived policy recommendations for both local and 
national government units so that their development plans and programs are backed by science-based evidence. We have established the UPLB Agapay program whose purpose is to respond to climate disasters and provide relief to affected communities. As we have always committed to, we continue to develop technologies such as the UPLB Sarai and hybrid plant varieties that allow stakeholders to adopt and thrive despite climate change. We are therefore very enthusiastic with regards to this initiative of APRU and Bard College and we believe strongly in its objectives and goals. Reaching a wider audience, informing them about how climate change impacts them on a local level and challenging them to find solutions will surely have tangible results with proper implementation. We hope that today's webinar will be an illuminating, engaging, and productive one for all the participants. And we applaud the DSDS Chair, Dr. Dino Gehes, together with the head organizers, Dr. Jennifer Marie Amparo Sunga and Professor Ron J. Dankalan for taking the lead in organizing this initiative. Let us all continue to work together in finding solutions that will allow us to adapt to climate change and mitigate the worst of its effects for the welfare of future generations. Thank you and stay safe. Pabuhay tayong lahat. That was, uh, of course, our very active um, Chancellor, Dr. Jose B. Camacho Jr., or as we uh, fondly call uh, Chancellor Tom. Okay, at this point, we'd like to call on an equally um, active and, uh, of course, our newest, uh, our new Dean of the College of Human Ecology, Dr. Ricardo M. Sandalo, to formally welcome you to this webinar. Dr. Ricky? Okay. Uh... A pleasant day, everyone. Magandang hapon. Uh, in behalf of the College of Human Ecology and its Department of Social Development Services, we would like to welcome everyone to this uh, webinar with the topic, Science and Art for Climate Action, a co-creative process. This is part of the commitment of the University of the Philippines and the College of Human Ecology as member of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, or APRO, and our, and our advocacy for sustainability and climate action. This webinar recognizes the need for more innovative and creative strategies to engage different sectors for climate action from policymakers, private and civil society sectors, communities, academe, and the youth. At this point, I would like to personally thank the following organizations and personalities without whom this event would have not been possible. Dr. Chris Trimawan, the Secretary General of APRO, and Jackie Wong, the Director of APRO Networks Program. Dr. Evan Goldstein, the Coordinator of the Solve Climate by 2030 of the Bard College. Uh, of course, UPLB Chancellor, Dr. Jose Dong Camacho Jr. UP Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Cynthia Bautista, and our very own Chair of the Department of Social Development Services of the College of Human Ecology, Dr. Dino Hages. We also would 
we are also grateful to the Office of the Institutional Linkages of UP and the Rex Publishing for their assistance in helping promote this project to our stakeholders and the public. Importantly, let me express our specific special gratitude to the distinguished speakers and resource persons who are willing and able to share their talents and expertise to this webinar. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Rodel Lasco, the Executive Director of OML, OML Center, Ms. Nasreen Camille de Castro, de Castro, the Country Manager of the Climate Reality Philippines Branch, Mr. B.J. Villafranca, a post of journalist, Ms. Kiri Dalena, our alumna, an independent filmmaker and artist, and definitely last but not the least, uh, Jerome Pineda and Kelvin Aguilar, the youth, youth educator and filmmaker from the Aquarian I Media. It is my ardent wish that through this webinar, we will all learn and experience ourselves in creating local and regional solutions to solve climate change by 2030. Thank you and mabuhay. Maraming salamat po, Dean Ricky. Ayan. Okay, so thank you very much again, Dean Ricky, for that. And at this point, we'd like to, of course, present to you the messages of our partners, our international partners, as mentioned by Chancellor Dong Camacho and Dean Ricky Sandalo. At this point, uh, Secretary General of the Asia Pacific Rim University will give his presentation and uh, welcome remarks as and to be followed by Dr. Evan Goldstein, Director for Center for Environmental Policy, Bard College, Coordinator of Salt Climate by 2030. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 U.S. states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. My name is Evan Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness? Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, Solve Climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history, bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice to the world. Time is short. We have until 2030, 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're going to discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice and how you can be a part of the solution. 
But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. Would you ask all your teachers this week in every subject to make climate a class? The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology to business, dance to chemistry. Teachers don't need to be a climate expert to lead a discussion about climate change. The Solve Climate Project has easy to use teacher's guides in nearly every subject and in three languages to help teachers make climate relevant to their class. It only takes courage. Don't take no for an answer. Ask them why not. This is your future. You'll be surprised how many teachers will say yes and thank you. Imagine you, thousands of leaders like you around the world asking their teachers once every school term to make climate a class. That means every term going forwards, hundreds of thousands, millions of students worldwide in their classes talking about climate solutions. COVID has shown how fragile our global economy and society are to extreme events. It's also shown that vulnerable people are facing the hardest, most damaging impacts. This is also true with climate change. Science has made it clear that unchecked, Global warming will mean an unending onslaught of extreme events, causing untold suffering for humanity and all creatures, species driven to extinction, a planet of environmental refugees. And yet, in many ways, this is the most exciting time to ever be alive as a human. We have the tools and networks and technologies to rewire the world with clean energy, reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation, and regenerate forests and grasslands, and be well on our way to solving climate by 2030. Tonight, we will learn how to do this in our own cities, our own towns, our own regions. Thank you for the work you will do to promote climate solutions and a just world. So thank you very much, Dr. Evan Goldstein from the Bard College. Okay. And then we will share with you the message of our partners from Asia Pacific Rim University. So as a resident in the western suburbs of Sydney, one of the most prominent impacts of climate change would have to be the increasing intensity and frequency of heat waves. And in particular, I realized that when you live in energy inefficient or poorly designed buildings, it's very difficult to stay cool and safe during these sweltering periods. And that's translated to me into an awareness of how the impacts of climate change are spatially differentiated, disproportionately impacting marginalized disadvantaged communities or people in peripheral spaces. So I might be studying in Japan now, but I'm actually coming from France, uh, from the southern region, the French Alps. In recent years, the winters have gotten a lot warmer. We're getting a lot less snowfall. Biodiversity in the mountain has become a lot less diverse. This is a threat for my community because in my home, tourism is the main source of revenue and the main economy. The effects of climate change in the country are manifested and felt in our food supply and in the varying weather in the country. For example, extreme drought or extreme flooding brought about by climate change can gravely affect the productivity of our agriculture and fisheries sector. More so, global warming also intensified the calamities that we face, for example, super typhoon, which isn't something that we would consider as normal 10 years ago. But because of the continuous warming of the ocean, we are now unfortunately expecting it to hit us at least once a year. This is urgent. There is no time to lose. We have to make sure that this planet is safe for humans to live. For everyone, not just 
the rich. I'm Chris Tremuen from APIU. We are a network of 57 universities around the Pacific Ocean. Asia, North and South America, Australia and New Zealand. Many of you are joining Solve Climate by 2030. We can do this and we can do much more. Together we can make a difference. Let's do it. I actually believe that everyone can do a little bit of something to fight climate change. We've seen how the climate crisis is mobilizing an entire new generation of active, performative citizens with students in schools and universities acting in solidarity and participating in protests, demanding change. Also, we must demand accountability from big-scale polluters such as the big companies who dominate the market and the government who leads the country because as long as these two refuse to act upon it and neglect the reality of climate change, all our individual efforts such as tree planting or shifting to a zero waste and green lifestyle will all be disregarded because fighting a big and complex issue such as climate change requires collective action. So if you also see there, wait just a moment. If you also see there, um, one of our students, Irish Remoto, was part of that video, who's the president of STP UPLB now, and also our major at the Social Technology Human DS Human Ecology. Okay, so as Dean um, uh, Chancellor. Uh, Dong and also Dean Ricky have said, we look forward for illuminating, productive, and engaging seminar. So I, I know you have a lot of questions already. So we have five sets of speakers. So we'll go through all the speakers um, um, one by one. Uh, the Q we will have a Q&A, a longer Q&A at the end. So please type your, um, type your questions in the Q&A tab. So the moderators, Dr. Willie Awitan and Prof. Chris Madlenov could, uh, could check on that question and address it to our uh, speakers later for the Q&A portion. All right, so at this point, I'd like to call on Dr. Emilia Bisco, uh, a professor from the Department of Social Development Services, CHE UPLB, to introduce our first speaker and to start the ball rolling. Thank you, Professor Amparo. Uh, our next speaker has more than 35 years of experience in natural resources and environmental research, conservation, climate change, and land degradation at the national and international level. He is one of the authors on the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the 2007 co-winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, and a member of the National Academy of Science and Technology in the Philippines a multi-awarded scientist with over 80 technical publications in national and international journals, dealing with various aspects of natural resources conservation, environmental management. He pioneered research in the Philippines on climate change adaptation in the natural resources sector and the role of tropical forests in climate change. He is the Philippines coordinator of the World Agroforestry Congress, or otherwise known as ICRAF, since 2004. ICRAF is a center devoted to promoting tree on farms. He is also the professor, affiliate professor this time at the affiliate professor of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, and concurrently the executive director of the Oscar M. Lopez Center, OML is a private foundation whose mission is to promote research on climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you our esteemed speaker, Dr. Rodel Velasco. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mili, and thank you all uh, for being here. And uh, I'm pleased to present to you uh, my paper and uh, just, uh, okay trying to uh, check it 
out. Uh, okay, so it's right there. Yeah, to present to you my paper on uh, engaging through research and communications for uh, climate uh, action. And uh, as uh, mentioned uh, already, uh, our center, the Oscar M. Lopez Center, is a nonprofit uh, organization. It was named actually after Oscar M. Lopez himself uh, because of his passion for environmental conservation. And uh, about uh, 10 years ago, he had this uh, prescient moment and uh, he realized the importance of uh, adapting to climate change as he saw uh, typhoons and other uh, climate related disasters uh, buffering uh, or buttering our country, I should say. And so uh, what he did was to uh, put his money where his mouth is, and he uh, uh, provided funding for the establishment of the Oscar M. Lopez uh, Center. Next, please. And the guiding principle of the center is simply, oops, uh, science. You know, we, we need science. Uh, we need to do climate action. But that climate action must be guided by the latest science. Next, please. And uh, so what I want to do now is to just uh, give you a sort of an overview of the kinds of activities we're doing in research as well as in communications that uh, we believe will lead to climate action. And I'll start more or less upstream in a more research oriented type of work and then slowly move towards the more communications uh, work. And here you can see one of our flagship projects uh, which we call Upturn and that is uh, realizing there are many adaptation solutions out there and uh, all over the country, people are adapting. And of course, we're still developing new adaptation options. But where do you find these uh, solutions? Now we realize there is uh, no uh, repository of these solutions. And so what we're doing right now is that we are developing a portal where we can uh, put or we can um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, assess and uh, list all the solutions and assess them and uh, provide any user in the Philippines and uh, for him or her to be able to visualize and, and even download uh, these adaptation solutions. So the idea is uh, like a one-stop uh, portal that will display uh, the many adaptation solutions in the country, uh, both their weaknesses, their strengths, uh, and uh, even scientific evidence. Next, please. Now, the other thing we're doing, again, this is just a sample, is using technology, for example, LIDAR, uh, GIS, and uh, many of you are familiar at the College of Human Ecology of these technologies. And we are trying to use them to study the impact of sea level rise, for example, in a coastal community in Leyte. Next, please. And then just recently, because of the uh, COVID-19, uh, sometime a year ago, we realized that uh, once the typhoon season rolls uh, along, we will be faced both with COVID as well as climate stressors like typhoon. And so here's the map that we, uh, we uh, you know, prepared uh, showing the density of COVID, uh, inci uh, COVID um, incidents uh, and the projected path of typhoon Ambo, the first typhoon last year. And I guess the message that we want to uh, bring to the fore here is that uh, you know, the pandemic, a global challenge, will have an interaction with another global challenge, for example, climate change. Uh, and as we have heard from uh, our uh, esteemed and distinguished uh, uh, speakers earlier, uh, this is the challenge of our day. And even as we face the pandemic, we realize that climate change, like for example, it's a manifestation uh, through stronger typhoons will affect how we cope with uh, COVID. Next, please. And then, uh, so now shifting a bit more to our publication. So we do our science. And by the way, we do our science in partnerships with uh, many of you, uh, UPLB and other universities uh, in, in the country and even outside the country. We're partnering with you to produce all these uh, products. Now, the other thing is uh, now sh uh, shifting more on publications and our link with policymakers. 
for the last five or six years, we have been working with the Climate Change Commission to produce our IPCC style assessment. We call this the PhilCCA, the Philippines Climate Change Assessment Reports. And uh, from 2016 to 2018, we released the three parts of this report. The first one focusing on climate science, the second one on impacts and adaptation, and the last one on climate uh, mitigation. And right now we're in the second cycle. We're just about to start the second cycle. And again, many of uh, our colleagues at UPLB are uh, part of this effort. Next, please. Uh, the other thing we're uh, uh, doing and working with Pagasta this time is we have been producing uh, a regular uh, state of the Philippine climate. Again, we realize there's a lot of data in uh, Pagasa. They're collecting all of this data, but we want to make this available to, uh, you know, to even lay people and researchers and other interested uh, uh, persons, uh, uh, those uh, with uh, or interested in climate uh, data. Uh, another example is the Philippine Climate uh, Almanac, which provides a more uh, laymanized uh, story of our climate. Next, please. And then uh, again, working with uh, our uh, government institutions and policymakers, we also uh, did a small project with the DENR with support from uh, the UNDP and the German government and trying to find out how the top or the banner programs of the DNR will be affected by climate change and what they can do uh, to anticipate and to prepare for and, and adapt to the projected impacts of climate change. Next, please. And then uh, on the private sector side, because we are uh, funded uh, by, uh, by the private sector, by a corporate, uh, uh, we are a corporate foundation in, in a sense. And uh, so what we're doing is we're uh, holding annual lectures. We call them uh, OML legacy lectures. And these are annual events. We bring uh, the top experts from outside the country and uh, they you know, lecture on uh, climate change and how it could affect uh, the way we do business in this country. Next, please. And then now moving on to more communication uh, side of things, uh, we also forayed in uh, docufilm uh, making about two years ago, we partnered with uh, the ABS-CBN Docu Central to produce this, uh, what we call Cuento ng Clima, which is a unique combination of uh, climate stories as told by uh, ordinary people in the zone, in the science and Mindanao, and in different, uh, coming from different sectors, and also scientists. So it, it's a film showing scientists speaking about climate change, but also ordinary people sharing their experiences on, on climate. And uh, incidentally, this won uh, an, an award in a US film uh, festival uh, last year. So we're very proud uh, of this work. Next, please. And as a follow-up, last year, we partnered with the Climate Change Commission to sponsor a kind of a film festival, a contest for uh, the youth of the country. So coming from 12 regions, we had uh, film labs, we, we had uh, scientists. Uh, in fact, one of your colleagues in human ecology uh, was part of the uh, experts we tapped to help uh, budding filmmakers all over the country. And uh, you know they produced five to six, seven minute uh, films. And it was very uh, you know, exciting to see our young people trying to uh, communicate climate, climate risks to their fellow Gen Z or fellow millennials and uh, you know, seeing their creativity in uh, communicating climate change. Because we realize uh, it takes more than just scientists to address climate change. We need all sectors of society, including our youth. Next, please. And uh, part of this uh, you know, fostering dialogue is what in fact, we call a climate dialogue or climate dialogues. We've been sponsoring uh, or brokering these dialogues, uh, coming, people coming from different sectors, di different uh, specialties or expertise. We work with the Philippine Social Science Council, for example, to uh, foster dialogue amongst the social scientists in the country. We also had a media perspective uh, dialogue with the Climate Change Commission and the International Office of Migration of the UN. Next, please. 
And uh, just recently, we completed our what we call Climate Resilience Challenge. And again, one of the winners is from UPLB. And this is a nationwide contest and challenging our uh, scientists, researchers to come up with uh, innovative solutions to our problems. And one of the winners is how we can, uh, yeah, you know, how we can uh, uh, clean or how we can have uh, water you know, for uh, using kind of a water impounding uh, technology. And some of our UPLB engineers uh, developed the concept, uh, one of the winners. The other is more on insurance, financial instruments uh, to enhance resilience. Next, please. And also we had a sea level rise forum, again, in partnership with the Climate Change Commission and with the Earth Observatory in Singapore. And uh, again, we were surprised at the many uh, interests that there were so many attenders. People are really interested in how sea level rise uh, will affect uh, our country. Next, please. And uh, finally, uh, almost uh, done now here. And uh, we are also are giving grants uh, initially to top, uh, our top universities all over the country. Uh, we are giving small research grants so they uh, work on climate change uh, adaptation. Next, please. And uh, we also tried, uh, and even now, I tried to engage the media. We are like op ed articles, sometimes we even guest in, in television shows, just so that we can bring out the message so that science can, uh, can sort of uh, come out or uh, uh, transition to the wider world out there. So we try to bring science to the more popular culture. And next, please. And we have a journal, by the way, we have a scientific journal. It's an open access peer reviewed. We call it the Climate Disaster and Development Journal. And I invite you, some of the researchers here, uh, please consider submitting to this journal. Next, please. And just recently, we inked a contract with Adarna House to produce a junior high level uh, book that will supplement the DepEd uh, uh, curriculum. Next, please. And that's uh, it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and back to you, uh, Jen. Thank you, Dr. Lasco. We are truly blessed and privileged with your presence and sharing in today's uh, webinar. Our next speaker is a manager of the Philippine branch of the Climate Reality Project, which has a current roster of more than 1,200 climate reality leaders nationwide. Having worked for almost a decade in the development sector, Nazca, as she is known among friends and colleagues, has gained political and technical expertise on climate policy development and has advised key government officials to help shape and advance the country's climate agenda, specifically in the strengthening of climate finance access, youth and stakeholder engagement, and climate advocacy building. She engaged in collaborative research on sustainable insurance facility and climate risk insurance for the micro, small, and medium enterprises sectors in Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. She is also an advisor to the Philippine alternate board member to the Green Climate Fund. Our speaker earned her degree in political science at the De La Salle University, where she was an academic scholar and a Jose Rizal awardee. Friends, Colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Nasreen Camille D. Castro. Nazca? Salamat, Prof. Emmy. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the honor to discuss with you today the role of the youth as co-creators of climate change actions in the Philippines. So my presentation will be divided into three segments. First is the youth as agents of change. Second, youth climate activists in the global south. And third, youth activism in the Philippines. So in recent years, the global youth climate movement has seen exponential growth. Young activists from all around the world are participating in the global discussion around the urgency and solvability of the climate crisis. According to the estimates from the United Nations, 
there are 1.21 billion young people between the ages of 15 and 24 in the world today. That accounts to 15.5% of the global population. The voices and contributions of the youth are essential for the advancement of any global movement. The Paris Agreement recognizes this. In fact, its preamble reaffirms intergenerational equity as a guiding principle in shaping climate action. Recognizing that future generations are threatened by global warming highlights the need to give the youth a seat at the table in climate policy making. This is why there is a growing call for the global climate negotiation processes, as well as national and local governments to create and engage youth climate advisory positions and councils. In an effort to engage young climate activists in a transparent and open dialogue, United Nations Secretary, and Gen uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres has taken the lead in creating the Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change that will advise him on the implementation of climate change strategies and actions. This is a powerful step toward greater youth inclusion, a move that was welcomed by young climate activists around the world. When we talk about young climate activists, the first person that comes into mind is 17-year-old Greta Thunberg. And rightfully so, because Greta is a fearless and passionate advocate for our planet. But so are her counterparts in the Global South. Greta recognizes this. In fact, she often mentions her fellow climate activists in her speeches, sharing the spotlight on young activists whose names we rarely hear because of the failure of the Western media to celebrate progress in other parts of the world. These young climate leaders are just as inspirational as Greta, with some of them working on their activism long before Greta started hers. We have Ridhima Pandey, who was just nine years old in 2017 when she filed a lawsuit against the Indian government for failing to take action against climate change. Ridhima's commitment to addressing the climate crisis was inspired by her mother's work as a forestry guard and her father's work as an environmental activist. Her whole family was displaced by the Uttarakhand floods in 2013, which claimed hundreds of lives. Vanessa Nakate, 23, was the first Fridays for Future climate activist in Uganda and founder of the Rise Up Climate Movement which aims to amplify the voices of activists from Africa. She spearheaded a campaign to save Congo's rainforest, which is facing massive deforestation. This campaign later spread to other countries from Africa to Europe. In January last year, she attended the 2020 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, with Greta and other climate activists. Advocates. While she hoped to widen the reach of her platform, she ended up at the center of a fierce debate over race and media representation when she was cropped out of a photograph by the Associated Press. Vanessa rightfully showed that the incident points to a wider issue of erasure of African voices in climate action conversations. In Kenya, Kaluki Paul Motuku, 28, has been working to champion meaningful youth engagement for climate action. Raised in rural Kenya by a single mother, Kaluki's vigorous activism was also inspired by the direct challenges his family faced from the effects of climate change. 16-year-old Aditya Mukherjee of India began a war against plastic straws in March 2018. Within just five months, he had already helped replace more than 500,000 plastic straws at restaurants and hotels in New Delhi and managed to keep 26 million straws and 2 million other plastic items from getting dumped in landfills. His immeasurable efforts now extend to campaigning for the conservation of forests and climate action. These are just some activists that are advancing climate change issues in the global south young leaders who are shattering any attempt by naysayers to delegitimize the climate movement by promoting the idea that it is just driven by privileged people from the global north. Young climate activists in the global south are taking different paths for climate action. First is activism, which includes advocacy, campaigning, and work in civil society organizations. Two is policy, and third is community-based work. This same vigor and passion from the youth sector are felt here in the Philippines. 
Youth activism in the country has accelerated in the past two years with the establishment of several youth-led movements and organizations, some of which are led and composed of young Pinoy climate reality leaders. Cha Reganon and her friends founded Wave Fairer Philippines in 2018 as a coastal cleanup initiative when they were grade 11 students. Today, the youth group has a network of grade school and high school students, including climate reality leaders, ready to raise awareness on climate and environmental issues and solutions in the country. In 2019, just months before the pandemic, youth leader B.C. Junel Tan established the Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, or YACAP, a nationwide alliance of youth organizations, individuals, and student councils that advocate for immediate global climate action led by the youth. Today, YACAP has regional chapters across the Philippines and now serves as the counterpart of Fridays for the Future in the country. In the same year, youth activist Jefferson Estella, together with other young climate act advocates, convened the Youth Strike for Climate Philippines to raise climate change awareness and mobilize for youth strikes in the Philippines. Similarly, climate reality leader Isa Barite and 11 young Filipinos have come together from different groups to establish For the Future PH, a youth initiative on harnessing the power of the youth to create change from reforestation, typhoon relief operation and mobilization to environmental and climate education and storytelling. In 2020, climate reality leader and mentor Bea Dolores joined forces with other youth advocates from other countries to organize Mock COP26, a two-week youth-led virtual event that mimics the processes of the Conference of the Parties and was participated in by more than 350 young delegates from 145 countries. This year, Climate reality leader Tasha Tanhutko, co-founder of youth empowerment nonprofit organization Kids for Kids PH, ventured into climate change and environmental education through the establishment of Habilin Philippines, a new youth-led movement that aims to advocate for a more sustainable lifestyle and to promote awareness on environmental, social, and climate change issues. Climate reality Leader Carissa Pobre, meanwhile, has been providing youth perspective in the work of the AGAM Agenda, a movement that aims to reimagine climate conversations through stories and the art. Her work at AGAM enables her to facilitate the transdisciplinary collaboration of experts, artists, and campaigners toward making the climate crisis more relevant to the Filipino people. Within our own community, the Climate Reality Project Philippines has established at the start of the year the youth cluster composed of climate reality leaders aged 15 to 30 years old. The youth cluster has now 497 members, a third of the total 1,239 Pinoy climate reality leaders. Hence, one of the immediate priorities of the branch when it was reestablished last year was to engage convene and mobilize climate reality leaders to discuss strategies, innovative methodologies, and new perspectives on addressing the climate impacts of the climate crisis. Our youth cluster is led by six youth coordinators who are doing an exceptional job at facilitating the convergence of ideas of young climate reality leaders and doing the legwork for the implementation of their own initiatives. The youth cluster is now working with the youth leaders of the Climate Reality Project Indonesia to establish a united and collaborative network of young climate reality leaders across Southeast Asia that are promoting solutions to address the impacts of climate change in the region. Our organizations believe that young people are capable of more than activism and community-based work. Given the opportunity to collaborate with lawmakers and leaders, young leaders can push meaningful climate policies. This is why since the establishment of the Climate Reality Project Philippine Youth Cluster last year, we have been looking for opportunities for our youth leaders to participate in critical climate change planning processes, such as the development of the Philippine Nationally Determined Contribution. In February this year, we were able to secure interventions during the stakeholder consultation facilitated by the Climate Change Commission and the Department of Finance in the meeting of the House Committee on Climate Change. Moving forward, we intend to support our young climate reality leaders through the conduct of the following capacity building programs. 
we have Klima Escuela, which will provide opportunities for the youth cluster members to deepen and broaden their understanding of climate science, policy, and governance. We also have Klima Pandayan, a series of interactive seminars and workshops where they can acquire new skills, approaches, and tools on how to be an effective climate advocate. We also have Build to Build, which will provide them access to Skillshare, an online learning platform where they can also take classes on various skill sets, such as creative writing, animation, photography, illustration, marketing, web development, data science, and more among others. And of course, we have a mentoring program where they can personally learn from the experiences of senior climate reality leaders on creating an impact in the climate change movement. Through these capacity support programs, the Climate Reality Project aims to uplift, amplify, and expand the reach of our youth climate reality leaders by providing them with the skills and resources to push for aggressive climate action and high-level policies that accelerate a just transition to low carbon development. Moreover, we intend to build on and explore more partnerships with youth-led climate organizations. In fact, we have recently formally forged a partnership with Kids for Kids PH and Habilin Philippines to create materials for sustainable development and climate change education. We have also initially met with Wayfarers to discuss how we can help them advocate for climate and environmental solutions. So ultimately, our goal in the climate reality is to bring together activists, scientists, politicians, faith leaders, and artists of all ages to ensure synergy and intensify the depth and breadth of our actions to address the prevailing climate crisis. So we believe that the youth is the key that will help us unlock this goal. So maraming salamat po mabuhay. Thank you very much, Ms. Nazreen, for that very um, interesting presentation where we saw the youth's role no, in uh, climate action. And now we move on to our next speaker, who was born and raised in Manila. He started his photojournalism career as a staff photographer for a national news magazine covering national news and social political stories. Since 2006, he has been a full-time documentary photographer and work with international newswire agencies and publications covering news and future stories, as well as pursuing personal projects and long-form stories of various regions of the Philippines. He is a lecturer on visual culture and documentary photography at the Asian Center for Journalism in the Diploma in Visual Journalism program at the Bachelor's in Photography course at the De La Salle College of St. Neil as well as for international photo festivals and conferences. You can see more of his work at www.djvillafranca.com. It is our honor to introduce and hear him talk on our uh, webinar this afternoon. Let us welcome Mr. Vicente Jaime DJR Villafranca. Sir DJ. Good afternoon to everyone and thank you again for um, uh, inviting me uh, to this very important uh, event and the uh, symposium and the conference. Um, this afternoon, I will be sharing um, a little bit of my experience as a documentary photographer. I think now more than ever, um, images and photographs are very important and um, most especially the way of communicating today in most of the digital platforms uses images. No? So I would like to share uh, a snippet of uh, um, my lecture or um, my, uh, my career or what I do uh, this afternoon. So it's entitled Framing Hard Truths and Documentary Photography as a Tool for Social Activism. Bakit siya Framing Hard Truths? No? Um, a lot of the stories or um, issues that uh, most especially with regards to the environment, I think can be considered as uh, hard truths. Dahil my, I think, um, as we know, uh, based on science, based on the news, um, mahirap tanggapin uh, what is happening to our um, environment. No? But at, at the same time, um, there are also ways on, uh, on how to address this. And I think uh, this, those uh, um, ways or those um, uh, ways forward, uh, we can learn something from the images and from the reports that, uh, that we see from photographers like me. 
So initial question, how do we look at the world? Or paano natin tignan at unawain ng mga nakikita natin sa paligid? Um, I think this is very important um, in this day and age of uh, social media and a lot of us uh, consume our, our, our take or get our information from uh, social media platforms. So I think it is very important that we ask uh, the images uh, or uh, we critique the images that we see and we receive uh, through these platforms. So this question is uh, very relevant and also this is something um, that is prevalent or that is a part of our practice as documentary photographers. How do we look at the world beyond um, what we see on the daily news? So for me, uh, nagsimula akong um, mag-focus on uh, the effects, the adverse effects of climate change. Uh, I think after uh, Typhoon Nundoy, uh, which is around 2009. No? Um, I was working as a full-time news photographer then uh, for different um, international agencies. And nakita ko uh, that there's a recurring theme of um, devastation and um, uh, catastrophe uh, in the Philippines. But I also questioned, um, is, it, is it all that, ito lang ba yun? Ito lang ba yung makikita natin sa, sa balita? Um, so I, I started questioning and I started looking at ano, uh, other uh, relevant information um, to sort of suffice this question in my head. So before I continue, um, just um, as, a, as a definition, photojournalism isn't about photography. Photojournalists like activists, academics, intellectuals, writers, etc. are also driven and motivated by moral, ethical, and political concerns. Many are people with ideas first and photographer second. Um, I think for myself, I, I, can, I can speak, uh, at parang this quote resonates to me because I come from a family of um, journalists and photographers. Um, but then I, it, 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 I never picked it up um, early on. I picked it up around late na, siguro mga early 2000s na lang. But then, uh, like I said, after I... Um, dove into the, into the stories of the environment and climate change, I think um, naging mas focused ako dun sa wider perspective. Hindi lang dun sa mga bagay na nakikita natin araw-araw o naibabalita sa news araw-araw. So tinanong ko sa sarili ko kung hanggang saan ko gusto um, i-cover or ikwento uh, ang mga nangyayari sa, especially sa Pilipinas. Na. And dahil dito, na-discover ko rin na maraming bagay or maraming mga um, quote-unquote truths or facts na naibalita na hindi masyadong nabibigyan ng pansin or naidi-discuss. Um, hindi lang sa news or hindi lang sa uh, balita but also in, in schools and other institutions. So I think this became my focus in establishing um, or in pursuing this, uh, um, this long-form project. So yung sunod na tanong is how do we speak visually or paano tayo makipag-usap gamit ang imahe or images or photographs at iba pang obra. So in my case, uh, mostly it's photographs. No? So like I said, um, after Undoy 2009, 2010, um, there was a lot of uh, words or ideas or topics that was floating around. And doon na nagsisimula yung mas mainit na pag, uh, pag-tackle uh, sa mga... Uh, sa uh, mga storya tungkol sa climate change, especially in other uh, places or in other regions of the Philippines, not only in, uh, in Manila. So isang, isang isa sa mga salitanian, or I think key words ay yung lumabas, is resilience na laging ginagamit sa pag, uh, pagkwento or pag-share ng mga bagay tungkol sa uh, experiences ng Filipinos about uh, the devastation or in general. No? Uh, we, were, we always kind of pick up this um this ter- this term terminology para i-discuss kung ano yung naging experience ng mga Pilipino and this became also a, a focus of my work bakit nga ba resilience totoo nga ba so this became a guide sorry, to- sorry. sorry. yeah Mr. DJ yeah. Um, hindi lang po naka-share yung inyong powerpoint maybe you can share it oh i'm really sorry uh, to screen share your powerpoint oh i'm sorry sorry okay one moment sige okay lang How about now? Yeah. Uh, yes. 
Oh, I'm really sorry. Thank you, Sir BJ. So, yeah, going to forward, uh, this is the title of my presentation, Framing Hard Truths and Documentary Photography as a Tool for Social Activism. So, yung nga, going forward, um, I think sinasabi ko kanina, how do we look at the world? And then further on, ito yung mga bagay na nakita ko uh, in the last, uh, since I started um, my, my focus on the adverse effects of climate change, which is uh, since 2009, after Ondoy. So a lot of these images come from that time, 2009, and then later on, uh, um, hanggang mga 2015, I was documenting different parts and dif different parts of the country and also different stories that relate to climate change. So yun nga, uh, as I said, ang naging, isa sa mga naging... Um, isa sa mga naging focus ng uh, long-form work ko or naging topics is um, how do I define resilience? Or we've always defined resilience as, um, you know, picking up ourselves after uh, an intense uh, devastation or, or an event. Um, but I, I, I tend to, um, like from the ground, I think I was trying to, to um, be a little bit more critical no? on, this, uh, on this topic. Um, so I was sort of like re trying to redefine uh, how we see resilience. So sa pag-ikot ko, um, as a documentary photographer, usually we observe, we observe a lot of things um, using geography and landscapes. So for example, this one in Zambales in Botolan, this was right after uh, Typhoon um, Ondoy, I think. Um, this is in early 2010. Um, so nakita ko yung devastation in the landscape also kind of changed. Um, but not only that, this picture can be, you know, it's sort of quote-unquote time, timeless because this, can be, this picture can be taken just yesterday or this can, this can be taken um, maybe 40 or 50 years ago. This image naman was taken um, maybe a month after Typhoon Haiyan made landfall in Tacloban. Um, so for me, the catalyst for this project and the, the main driving force um, to redefine that idea of resilience for me was documenting the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan. And this one is, uh, again, I think this was maybe two or three weeks after the, the landfall in D1 where they were evacuating a lot of the displaced uh, communities. And this one was in um, Palo, in Leyte. Uh, it was, I think, a uh, psychiatric ward in one of the government hosp hospitals there. Because I was asking the, um, I think the one, in, the doctor in charge, if there was a lot, there was a rise of um, cases of uh, mental disturbed, being mentally disturbed or depression and so on. And I think uh, she mentioned na at that time, wala pa, because I think this was about maybe almost, a, let not even a year pa lang, I think al almost six months. But, all, but for me, I think isang bagay yun na uh, hindi masyadong nade-discuss, no? yung mental um, aspect or yung uh, stress that we go through and also the, how it is um, reflected in the idea of resilience. Um, images like this, uh, sometimes uh, pag walang context, hindi natin siya masyadong maintindihan. But then, this is an image of a boy who's swimming, I think, for the first time in, this, in the exact uh, lake or water that took away uh, hundreds of families in, uh, in Tacloban, in downtown Tacloban. And also, um, in the wider perspective nga of um, photographing and the documenting the adverse effects of climate change, and also the idea of resilience, may mga bagay na hindi natin uh, masyadong mabigyan ng pansin, katulad ng uh, isang napaka-importanting topic, katulad ng human trafficking, no? na according to UN um, reports, na tumaas yung human trafficking numbers, especially at the onslaught, uh, at the height, at, at the aftermath of uh, Typhoon Haiyan. So ito yung mga bagay na uh, I think minsan hindi natin masyadong napap, nap, nabibigyan ng puna and I think photography or uh, photographs and um, documentary or news or whatnot in all kinds, in all forms, ay makakatulong para magbigay ng attention to, uh, tungkol dito sa mga topic na ganito. 
And lastly, of course, the displacement of communities. Um, all in all, the, the main topic, uh, the main focus of uh, my long form work, which is Cygnus, uh, was the, the experience of displaced communities. Not only calling them displaced communities, but actually contextualizing and diving, diving deeper into their daily experiences. Katulad nitong mga displaced na uh, communities from Laguna, uh, from a flooding in Laguna in 2012, na matagal na silang nakatira dito sa former cola factory uh, in um, I think Los Banos or Santa Rosa. So for so, so many months, naging ganito yung buhay nila. At in this, I think reflects a lot of the communities and the experiences um, of Filipinos who've experienced a similar situation na naging, naging, naging um, victim ng typhoon at naging biktima ng uh, mga devastations, baha and so on. And the second part of um, my work um, and also the most, I think, the, the important aspect of it is how to share and how to reach an audience. No? Traditionally, as photographers or as documentary news photographers, um, meron ang nagaantay ng mga platforms, katulad ng magazine, newspapers, um, TV, and then later on the internet, um, to publish our work. Um, but for, for me, um, you know, nagsubok pa rin ako to reach out to different uh, to, uh, to other platforms um, to be able to ano to sort of uh, widen the reach of my uh, or widen uh, parang um, reach more audiences so the culmination of um, that work um, one of the you know one of the out outputs is this book um, published in 2017 by Mapa Books uh, entitled Signos. So it's uh, a selection uh, and a compilation of my work since 2009 to So yon, apart from the book, um, actually before the book was published, uh, excerpts of this project was uh, already featured and published in different um, news publications and online publications. For example, like this in a traditional platform or traditional publication, a news magazine publication, um, how a photo essay is usually or a documentary body of work is usually published. Um, also on Instagram, Instagram and social media became a very critical and important tool, no? um, I think at least for me when I was doing my, uh, uh, when I was pursuing this project because it helped me um, share bits and pieces of uh, information of the project and of the things that I gather on the road. But also a lot of it, uh, I, I even, um, mas marami akong nakukuwang information at mga additional um, facts and stories um, dahil sa pag-share ko sa social media. So naging magandang um, tools are for me to gather uh, information and to widen the scope. So, meron din mga community uh, community based um, platforms katulad nito, Everyday Ch Climate Change, which is a consortium of different photographers, visual journalists from all over the world who tackle climate change. Um, um, it's, it's an expert ex excerpt of uh, a community called the Everyday Community or uh, the yeah Everyday Community. 
um, ito, you see everyday climate change is only focused on um, environment and the adverse effects of climate change. And here in the Philippines, we have Everyday Philippines, which also tackles different um, um, social cultural issues, social political issues as well. Um, and it also does uh, feature um, environmental. Yeah, and online platforms as well has been very supportive, especially at that time no, na uh, nagiging mas um, kumbaga maingay or mainit yung pag, um, pag, uh, pag de discuss ng uh, topics on climate change. Public engagement, public exhibitions has also been a very important part of uh, what I do or for, for documentary photographers because this is the time where you can reach um, or we, you can engage or at least before the pandemic. No? You can engage with a lot of uh, audiences from students to, to gallery uh, visitors or to normal citizens and uh, they, they ask a lot of questions uh, with regards to the photographs. And lastly, um, I, I also tried to, you know, as I mentioned earlier, widen my uh, collaborations. No? And I reached out to a group of um, street artists uh, called Filipina Street Plan and gave them access to, to, the, to my whole archive, to the archive of Signos to choose from. And they could choose uh, a photograph that they can um, illustrate in their own ways. Oh, so may, may mga, kunari, this one on the upper left, which yung nakalagay change, climate change, uh, was pasted in, a, in an abandoned um, warehouse, I think, or abandoned house, abandoned property in Marikina, where uh, a lot of um, um, flooding happened, especially during Andoy. Uh, the one on the right uh, was pre-painted uh, during, um, in, in a mural in, in Dubai. And the one on the, um, the bottom um, images were uh, painted around uh, Cubao and the uh, Quezon City area. So I think in this, uh, ang gusto ko lang sana mangyari dito is for, for people to see different facets of um, not only uh, the photographs, but also of climate change, no? of, of things that, you, um, that we may have missed because sometimes um, the stories and the storytelling aspect can be a little bit um, uh, intimidating and um, scientific at times. And lastly, um, I did a collaboration with the director, uh, with the Filipina Cebuana director, si Joanna Arong. Um, and it became, a, it's, it's a nominee actually for this year's World Press uh, Photo Online Video of the Year. The title of the film is um, To Calm the Pig Inside, or Ang Pagkalma ng Uno, Ang Pagkakalma sa Unos. And I think you can view it in, in this website. So to end, I would like to uh, borrow a quote from our uh, National Artist for Literature. So only with steadfast memories can we now be strong so as to undo the mistakes of the past and to begin anew and build from the rubble of their betrayal. So images are a very important part of um, uh, history uh, so that we may never uh, forget what happened and also can be a lesson, a reminder uh, for us on, what, on, on how to address our current situation, um, environmental situation. Thank you and uh, yun lang, salamat po. Thank you, Sir BJ. Ayan. So I think um, the one that Chancellor Long mentioned that it's illuminating and engaging. I think the art, the photos that you show is really illuminating and really engaging, no? not only um, one sector, but across the sector. So thank you very much, Sir BJ. So with that, uh, I'd like to present the next speaker. Uh, Prof. Clarice Polubaric will introduce our next speaker, who's also an independent artist. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker in this webinar. Ms. Gabriela Crista Kiridalena is an acclaimed visual artist and filmmaker known internationally for her works that lay bare the social inequalities and injustices that continue to persist, particularly in the Philippines. Two of her works that touch on the topic of environmental justice and climate change 
are the documentary film Tungkung Langit or Lullaby for a Storm and the video still and installation Washed Out. Delena is a recipient of the Cultural Center of the Philippines 13 and the Ateneo Art Awards for Contemporary Arts. She is a graduate of BS Human Ecology at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Let us all welcome Ms. Kiri Delena. Yes, um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Clar. Um, I am honored to be invited to this uh, webinar, uh, and I feel um, nervous uh, actually to be, to be back again, to be connected once more with the College of Human Ecology uh, and Euclid Banos. Uh, it, it, uh, my experiences there, I think, really um, pushed the direction that I took as an artist. Um, I um, yes, yeah, so I'm a graduate of the College of Human Ecology, and I decided to pursue uh, filmmaking independently after I graduated. And um, from being part of be, from forming uh, film collectives in Southern Tagalog, such as the Southern Tagalog Exposure, uh, I eventually uh, went into collaborations. Uh, with other um, artists and writers. And uh, the film that I will talk about, um, Tungkung Langit, and the installation that I also made, uh, Washed Out, uh, they were done in 2012. But uh, I would say that uh, these were done, but these were really not planned, but it felt like it was the, the most logical thing to do as an artist. So, um, okay, so the title of my presentation is Documenting Diverse Climate Narratives for Social Action. So, uh, Clara introduced me, but my background is, is really, uh, I am a filmmaker that has done mostly documentaries and reports about um, human rights violations. Uh, I started doing this um, when I was in, in Southern Tagalog, but then afterwards, I began to collaborate with a journalist, uh, the journalist Patricia Evangelista, who was working for ANC. And uh, in the process of documenting mostly human rights violations, we experienced typhoons in Metro Manila. The first one, which VJ already talked about, was Ondoy in 2009. And of course, um, this direct experience really changed um, our perception of what can really happen, you know, all of our gains in, in organizing and investigating human rights violations will just have to stop because of this um, tragedy. And um, after that, I'd like to talk about uh, this sendong. Uh, my process is really, I, I usually make videos which are close to, close to my heart, meaning this is, this is because of also, um, I would say, constraints, meaning I make the most of my limitations. So I like to work with what, where I could um, possibly immerse for a long time. Uh, in my experience with working with, for example, um, ANC, which usually they have a deadline and you have to come up with a report first, that really works for the news. But uh, my process is I, re I really like to immerse and to stay for a long time. And, um, and I think this, this process was developed because of my experience in the College of Human Ecology, where we were really, uh, as students, we, we stayed in barangays. Uh, I would still remember Barangay Louisiana, uh, in Louisiana and Barangay Sadlak in um, Los Baños and stay for a long time. Um, so, okay, next slide, please. So, so Sendong, Typhoon Sendong or Washi took place in Iligan City in December of 2011. 
uh, I was already based here in Metro Manila at that time, but Iligan City happens to be by my mother's um, hometown. And when it happened, uh, my mo motivation for going there was not really to make a film, but to contribute to relief um, efforts. So I went there, uh, and then I also had a video camera. And then when we went there, that was when I started to feed the information that was happening in Idigan City to other journalists. And we realized the, the, the massive um, tragedy that happened in Idigan City. So um, next slide. The next slide is a video. It's courtesy of um, Rappler, but is actually about my work in 2012 in Ili and my experience in Iligan City. So this is an excerpt. Iligan is the birthplace of my mother and I've spent you know, the happiest years of my childhood there. I found out about the storm the morning of December 17. You would say it was surreal in a sense. You go to an area, you thought that you know this was part of a river or the riverbed. Then they explained that these used to be homes, these used to be houses. I saw rows and rows and rows of logs, like layers of layers of logs. Some of them still had roots, but a lot of them were already cut. If there were no logs, more, more people would have survived. During the flood, there was about 4,000 or 5,000 logs that uh, were swept from the mountains. And when they came down from the river, they wiped out all of these houses and also trees along the way. The Iliganons who tried to save themselves by staying on top of their homes or by climbing trees, they didn't survive because of the logs. Okay, so, um, so yes, when I first went there, as I explained, I, I did not really go there to, ma to make a film, but for relief um, operations and found myself also becoming a sort of a, you know, reporting or telling journalists which barangays um, still did not receive relief and um, which ones were neglected. And so it did really helped that I was from there. Um, but at some point, uh, I in the last barangay, which we visited, Barangay Dikilaan, where the, we accompanied a group called the JCs for early distrib distribution, uh, some barangay members went to me and said that th there, there are orphans here and perhaps you should shoot them and give the footage to the news so that they would give help. And I was surprised because I've never really um, done any documentaries with children and very recently traumatized children. And the, the people there believe that if you know, they're interviewed and you know, ask these questions, it would help. But there and then, I, even if I did not have this training about um, handling these situations, I just knew that it was not the right thing to do. So I, I did not continue interviewing them and instead uh, went back, brought art materials and started to form a relationship or a friendship with the children. So next slide. Um, so 
the children did not really tell me about uh, so we held art workshops not just for the children who were uh, who became the victims but also to their neighbors so that they wouldn't feel separated and these are just some of the drawings that came out in, in 2011 um, so next slide so these are other drawings and then from the drawings you would see um, a child in the middle of the water and if you go back to the previous slide there would be also be snakes and always these images of logs so there are many drawings but these are the drawings that where these came out and the the fact of the matter is I did not go to see the logs first I really went to the communities first for relief efforts and when the child told me because I asked why is there a snake in your why are there many snakes in your drawings and the, the child said she was a nine-year-old oh there's a snake in my drawing because I tried to survive by riding a log by clinging to a log you know it was midnight and then she said that and there were there was also a snake in the log and I had to run across the log to to hide from the snake I did not understand yet I thought that perhaps she used a different word you know to run across the log but then when I finally went to the to the Iligan Bay where the logs were collected that was when I saw the logs and understood that it really was possible because the the logs were just so huge the trees next slide um, for example this is this is just one of the logs which were left behind so can you imagine the scale uh, and imagine these these trees these logs tumbling you know rushing down from the mountains to the river okay so next slide so i um from December, I decided to stay on and, and continue. And this is an image, for example, of, um, of the place where they stockpile the, the logs which are recovered from the sea. And I would always observe these children um, playing on top of these logs, which destroyed, which killed thousands of people and destroyed homes. But you know, I wondered at how resilient these children are. <laughs> Um, playing and laughing um, that that was just a thought and then later on okay next slide um, it 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 happened in December but it took a long time before I decided to make a film you know I continued the relationship by, by September so that was after nine months I came back and stayed for a month uh, with this family uh, with two children Apolonio and Analu uh, who lost their mother and father and three siblings to the storm. Um, they survived by riding, by clinging on to logs. And the child, Anna, Anna Lou, this is a reenactment, by the way. Um, she found herself in the sea, 42 kilometers away. Next slide. Okay, so this is an excerpt. This is from the opening of the film. Saan ang minawa ni Mili? Wala na sila. Ay lang. Ay, mag-uwi. Wala. Saan ang minawa ni Mili? Wala na sila. Wala na kami nila. Wala naman itong sila ba? Tabo na yun. Hello, Hello. 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 Hello.
Okay, um, next slide. Okay, so um, the process, you know, the process of immersion was long, and it was also uh, uh, deliberately trying to make um, the children comfortable and understand what who we were, what we were doing, what was the camera for, you know, the limits, and at some point, um, they they actually learned how to handle the camera. And we would just have um, codes as to, you know, if they want to stop. Um, so this is a, photo, a photograph, for example, of a Polonia um, shooting. And some of the interviews, we would leave them to talk to each other. And this was, I believe, the way of um, having a glimpse or entering into how the children were, were processing uh, their experience and processing it very differently from, from adults. Uh, okay, next photograph. Okay, so this is Anna Lou, um, his, his younger sister who also survived. And uh, the film is 20 minutes long and it, it has been shown um, like last, it, it's, it was made in 2011, but it continues to be shown. Like last year, it was shown in the Ang Dokyu Film Festival and then uh, by next month, it will be shown again online for free at the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design in St. Penilde uh, online. So you can watch it. Uh, okay, next, next slide. Uh, so this is another, uh, another work that was inspired by what, what happened. Um, I made it immediately after uh, in, the, in December after the December incident in Ibigan. And uh, I call it washed out because this is a term that became popular, you know, in the same way that now we have terms like uh, physical distancing, uh, but that time it was washed out because of all of these logs. And uh, next slide. Um, the idea was when I was there, I realized that it was just so impossible to communicate, um, to convey um, the physicality, the enormity of, of these trees that, that destroyed the city. And I asked permission because so they would, they repurposed the logs, you know, to rebuild the destroyed homes. But there were, there were trees that were left behind, specifically the balete trees, which the people feared. And I asked permission if I could have those balete trees. And the, the balete trees were sliced, but before doing that, we, would, we performed the rituals according to what the community believed. So it became praying, lighting candles, as well as um, sacrificing chickens before we moved the balete trees, which were considered sacred um, in the community, and before we cut them. Okay, next slide. So, uh, so this, these balete trees uh, were transferred, were moved um, from Iligan City to Metro Manila. Uh, at that time, I, I'm also a visual artist, so I asked permission. So instead of, a, instead of a commercial exhibition, can I transform the exhibition into this installation? Uh, and I was fortunate that the owners of the gallery agreed and allowed me to bring in these logs. Uh, so next slide. So the idea is to communicate the scale of what, you know, the effect of, of the, of the fl flood and the, the impossibility of, of, of this experience. You know, the, I, I can't even find the words to, to, to explain it. And uh, also I wanted to give people a sense of, of the scale of the tragedy and and somehow I, I always find it painful that we often need to experience a tragedy firsthand before we move, before we understand and we take action. And I thought that perhaps if we create films, if we create installations like this, you know, people will get a greater sense, you know, a three-dimensional sense of, of what happened or what could happen. So next slide. Okay, 
So just another shot. And then next slide. So after the exhibition, which ran for a month, um, I asked permission uh, from the protected areas in Wallach Bureau if I could move these, these trees, these pieces of, of the tree to, to the National Minoya Kino Parks and Wildlife Center. And they readily agreed. So we moved it there. It remains there. And the last photograph is uh, from my last visit there, where I was so happy to see birds there <laughs> um, among the logs, but then realized that they they have uh, they have um, sort of put their territory there, and this bird actually attacked me afterwards. <laughs> there, okay, so. Um, those are the slides uh, that I wanted to show. So uh, these document, these uh, sendong, um, like what Vijay said, it, it became different after Ondoy, like um, places where floods shouldn't be happening. Um, you know, it took place there. Iligan City, we... Uh, Whenever there are floods or storms here in Manila, my relatives would always say that, come here, move to, move to Mindanao because there are no storms there. But then after Sendong in 2011, in 2012, Pablo happened. And then by 2013 in Visayas, uh, Yolanda happened. Um, I would say because of the, one of the questions that I was asked to answer was, um, what are, what's my what's my key message about the short films and um, how do I envision my films to create broader discourse about climate change? I would say that I have only scratched the surface when it comes to conveying um, the realities of climate change in, in the works that I, I have been doing. I wanted very much to continue it. Like after Sendong, I went to Pablo and then by, 20, by 2014, uh, in northern Mindanao, uh, activist leaders and indigenous groups found out that I was a filmmaker. And that was when I also created other longer, longer form documentaries and realized that it, there is a greater picture, a bigger picture, which really connects environment and the people as well as the people in power. And, um, and that is why uh, I feel that it is impossible to to make a film about the environment without engaging as well with the communities, the people who live there. So, Yana uh, Laguna, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kiri. Um, we are pleased that you joined us in this webina webinar where we get to listen to a fellow alumna of human ecology um, sharing uh, a personal experience, stories of communities, and emphasize the need for action through your work. Indeed, you've shown us that through our experiences, it helped shape us not just personally, you know, but also as advocate, and it also helped us and lead us to what we are most passionate about. I am sure our listeners are inspired by your stories and drawn by your presentation to make climate a class and solve climate by 2030. Again, thank you, Ms. Kiri, for your presentation. Before we, we proceed with the next presentation at this point, we would like to recognize the presence of Ms. Jackie Wong, the Director of Networks Program of APRU. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us this afternoon. And now for the final presentation in our webinar, our next speakers are youth educators who won first place in the first Klima Film Festival held in 2020 by OML Center and Climate Change Commission with their entry entitled Our World. For the next 10 minutes, let us listen, be inspired, and learn from our youth educators, Jerome Pineda and Kelvin Aguilar of Aquarian iMedia with their presentation, Our World, Climate Narratives Through the Youth's Perspective. Take it away, Jerome and Kelvin. Thank you so much, ma'am, Marife. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and um, allow me to share our slide for this afternoon. Okay, just, just a moment. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, can you see the slide na po? Yes, Kelvin. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. So we are uh, the representatives of the Aquarian, Aquarian Eye Media. I am Kelvin Aguilar, and with me is the director of the film, uh, Jerome Pineda. Sir Jerome. Okay. Uh, medyo unstable po kasi yung connection niya kanina, but um, still, um, uh, we will be presenting uh, the short film that uh, have won the first Klima Film Festival 2020 last November uh, 25. Uh, and um, just to have a quick uh, preview of the short film that we made, um, this is the poster and our world won the best film for the said film festival as mentioned and also we were very um, blessed and honored to be chosen by the uh, set of judges na talagang uh, very nakaka wow when we learned that this were the, the panel of judges that uh, judge our film so the uh, House Speaker, the House Deputy Speaker Lauren Ligarda, and of course the director of the OL, OMLC, direct, director doc, Dr. Rodel Lasco, CCC or Climate Change Commission, Commissioner Rachel Herrera, and of course in the film sector we, uh, they had Director Kidla Tahimik, Love Diaz, and Brillante Mendoza. So these were the judges. Uh, as mentioned uh, in the film festival. So our world is uh, talks about a nymph who flourishes the earth through the aid of three elemental dragons in live, is living in peace and serenity until intruders from the royal castle invade the land and the sky with their selfish and destructive acts. After being firsthand witnesses of their viciousness, the dragons gather their collective power to inflict the greatest retribution among mankind. So um, this film um, is really uh, just simple because we, we, the team uh, made it um, during the height of the community quarantine, especially here in Luzon. So uh, we were, the team were um, very... Um, parang, we do not have really face-to-face -face, uh, communication when, when we produce it. So uh, I'll just, we will have to share it for you para mas makita po ninyo kung what is the film all about. And later on, points about the short film.
All right, so so that's it. That that's our short film um, in the Klima Film Festival. So, uh, actually, um, it's really a challenge for the team to come up with a short film in the height of pandemic, especially in the quarantine uh, time, because we cannot uh, really see each other face to face, and we cannot, you know. Um, talk uh, every now and then we we only set meetings online so what we uh, uh, do is that um, we come up with uh, what is really uh, possible for us to to do especially with our resources and we do not have much you know resources that I know so our our one of uh, two of our members were uh, really um, into drawing so we opted na yun nga po um we opted that to showcase that drawing at the same time we also did not include any dialogues na because of you know the limitations also but i think uh, that is uh, what makes it more interesting because um the audience uh will uh, also create their own interpretation of the film so our key message is to show the impact the devastating impact of climate change especially the drought pollution loss of natural habitats illegal activities loss of aspirations hopes and lives um i think sir jerome still having a an internet connection problem but um can i hear from sir sir jerome hello Okay, Ayan. Sir Jerome, uh, uh, please um, um, show us the Hello? next slide. Yeah, go. Hello, can you hear me po? Yes, loud and clear. Hello po, so good afternoon po sa lahat. So these are the symbolisms that we use uh, in our film spot. So uh, next slide po, please. So these are the three elemental dragons that are, you know, um, ex, uh, parang symbolizes the uh, element, elements, the basic elements uh, in, in our world. And the flower is, uh, is us that is being nourished by, by them. So, Sir Jerome. Okay, so this... These were the illegal activities that were, you know, um, happening uh, across uh, uh, across the uh, the ocean, like uh, what we have uh, shown. Uh, maraming mga uh, mga chemicals that were thrown in the ocean, and also sa mga pollutions in in the air, and also it results to you know. Without these elements, when the dragons were really weak and were parang nawala sila ng energy to nourish us, we become also weak. We also become um, lifeless uh, in that sense. And the one that is um, guarding us or nourishing us is uh, this this girl that symbolizes the Mother Earth. So, ayan po, um because of our selfish and destructive uh, actions yan medyo 
uh, na wawala also yung ating respect sa Mother Earth. And yun, the uh, when we say the ret retribution, um, this were the, the forces of nature na talaga namang when they hit us, hindi, hindi sila nagbibigay ng, ano, na, hindi sila nagbibigay ng babala. They'll just go and um, show us um, uh, no mercy, sabi nga, when it comes to, you know, natural calamities and also the typhoons, the cyclones, the flooding, soil erosion, etc. So, these were also the, um, like, talagang the lives and um, aspirations will be in jeopardize because of the, you know, forces of nature na hindi talaga sila mapipigilan kahit mayaman or mahirap ka, no, wala silang uh, tinitignan na social status. And in this case uh, naman, um, if you may notice that the parang mga kontrabida or the ano, sa, uh, sa short film namin, this um, ano, ay nanggaling sa mga matataas or parang elite na palasyo. These are, this symbolizes that um, most of the uh, climate uh, violators are those, you know, in power also. And um, uh, sila yung mga, as mentioned earlier, if you, uh, if you also noticed the presentation of the UPL, bina, big companies, big, um, um, you know, violators, mga ganun. So this symbolizes them. Uh, but again, um, in our hands, in, in our hand lies the power to change the world. Um, nasa, uh, if we are the source of the problem, then we can also be the solution to the problem. And in that case, um, with collaborative efforts, we can, you know, make uh, uh, this world a better uh, place for us to live, especially um, in the near future. And I am very much. Um, um yung inspiration namin sa short film is that really um sabi nga nila kapag gumagawa ka ng film go deep inside your heart kung ano yung malapit sa puso mo yun yung gawin mo ng story so um yung community namin is a really mountainous community here in uh Bambantarlac if you are familiar with the resettlement areas being built after the devastating eruption of Mount Pinatubo, then uh, ito yung isa sa mga lugar na naging um, resettlement area namin and to build our house. But again, it is not really uh, guarded with, you know, hindi siya ganun ka... Everyone is prone. Every place is prone to climate um, uh, change... Uh, yung negative effects na climate change. So, uh, the, the typhoons were very frequent. Um, in 2013, ka kasabay siya ng Yolanda sa Visayas. But here, in our town, we had uh, Typhoon uh, Santi na talaga naman very strong. And um, one month kaming nawalan ng kuryente at tubig because of that typhoon. So, um, that uh, really inspired us to create more films that are in line with um, um, climate change and climate action. And also, so yun nga, as mentioned, the those uh, moving film, uh, those moving uh, characters kanina na, nakita natin sa short film are all in stills. Um, din rowing lang po sila in each frame, iba-iba po yung kanilang um, pagkakaano. And then, we also create uh, movement, uh, an illusion of movement para, you know, ma mas maging engaging at the same time, mas maging um, entertaining to more audience. Uh, if you may notice also na pang general talaga, pang general public po yung aming um, short film. And um, for the youth na nag tatanong din, sometimes there are people na how do you make films, natatanong how do you make short films, but we uh, we only answer na uh, kung wala kaming, uh, wala, hindi namin kailangan ng mga high-end filmmaking equipment like mga DSLR, mga something talagang mamahalin because we cannot afford those kind of equipment. Um, what we only do is that we 
no use of our make use of our resources what is in front of us and like uh, mobile phones and yon we also use our um um mas, uh, resourcefulness kung ano yung available yun lang ang ginagamit namin so as to create um parang hindi siya ganun ka parang hindi siya ganun kahirap gawin din and also another thing is that we prioritize our story more than the 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 technique the equipment that we will be using because we believe that story is always the king in um creative uh process or creative making uh, a film or a short film and uh paano naman uh, ang youth uh, na makakatulong sa climate action you know um we are just really a, sh a small production team hindi kami yung sobrang big but we are very fortunate that um, more than being recognized here in the philippines uh, our short films were also recognized abroad like in the united nations and we were also uh, get to be invited in um, symposiums and conferences that were um, sponsored by the united nations to also share our works with other uh, nations so um, we believe that the youth sector is a powerful sector in, address the, in addressing pressing societal issues like this one, climate change, because they, uh, they got the energy, the creativity, the knowledge, and the wisdom. And kulang lang po sa kanila, you know what, is that um, sometimes our policymakers, our um, current generation is that uh, the youth sector is being seen as just mere um parang mere recipient of the policies mere recipients of uh what should uh they do but without uh being invited them to the table to talk about their um solutions or ideas and then um i believe that um they needed to be tapped and empowered in in the case na like this one, that there are a lot of platforms that you know um, empowers the youth. Na they are really capable of doing, uh, making change, especially addressing climate change. And uh, they they only need these resources and this um, support from the really um, capable or able uh, companies or organizations to push their um, um, ideas. And having said that, uh, I think um, everyone has climate story to tell. And the question is, what is yours? And how are you going to tell it? So um, I think we're through with the presentation. And thank you very much for inviting us to this uh, platform. And again, I am Kelvin Aguilar. And with me is the director, Sir Jerome Pineda. And we are the Aquarian Eye Media. Thank you very much, Bo. And Hope you enjoyed the film. Thank you for. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for all the panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. At this point, uh, we are now open for your questions addressed to our experts. No, and I am your moderator, Assistant Professor Awitan. Now, um, if you have questions, please make your question concise and direct. To address questions to specific panelists, please include the name and the questions to to be asked. Okay, now to begin, we have several questions here. Um, address to probably to Miss Nasrin Castro. Castro, mom, can the youth organize environmental activism right now, especially here in the provinces, to let our voices be heard and we will not be arrested or red tagged? Yeah, sir, uh, Professor Wilf, uh, Wilfred. Uh, I think the, the following questions is also similar and I've answered three uh, previous questions already, but I would just like to share um, um, in summary um, my answers for, for all the questions related to um, joining uh, an, order, an organization, how to engage our local leaders. So um, in my previous, um, in my uh, answers, I've listed down several suggestions that could be um, 
implemented or conducted by our uh, interested uh, climate advocates. So first, um, yes, um, it's very scary now uh, with the implementation of the anti-terrorism law. But um, I would still encourage our youth um, climate advocates to first join and support a local organization. It is important that our personal and individual actions are translated into community actions to create more impact. Uh, your organization will also guide you on how to start your environmental and climate journey. And if natatakot kayo na mag-isa lang, it's better to act in a group and as an organization. And of course, um, in an organization like the Climate Reality Project Philippines, we do have mentors. They are experienced um, climate activists and um, we also have climate scientists. Um, we have um, climate leaders who are part of the government and we could start that dialogue. Second, engage your local leaders. Demand better decisions and actions. Is your local community aware of your own climate risks and vulnerabilities? How are they addressing them? What are your community's climate and disaster protocols? Is your local community also aware of these efforts? If no, uh, then vote for the better leaders that could champion the climate movement. So it's very important that our actions now would really define and lead us to um, a better situation by 2022. Third is believe in your capability to take lead and initiate action. I've mentioned many young climate reality leaders who are already taking action like Greta. Um, she started her climate strikes on her own. Now it's a global movement joined by millions of advocates around the world. So raise your voice, amplify other voices. And fourth, um, utilize your skills and talents. Know what you're capable of. Um, is it writing, producing visuals, public speaking? Is it research? Um, um, in the area of food security, water, and so on. So set your par parameters to which you can affect change. And um, in terms of engaging the youth, sabi ng iba na um, they, they do not see, in, um, parang they don't seem interested to join um, organizations like Climate Reality Project Philippines and other climate and environmental organizations. Um, I think kasi, uh, the challenge is that climate change concepts are seen as very technical and very scientific. So our um, our responsibility is to localize and laymanize uh, these concepts based on the experiences of the community. And to engage more youth in our organization, we, use, uh, we need to be creative. So we use climate stories. Each of us um, have our unique climate stories, not uh, and they not only fuel and empower both our individual and collective advocacies, but also they could enlighten uh, other people um, in the reality of climate crisis. And of course, we use um, art. Art is, art is very important in communicating climate change. Art is something that sparks our interest and passion. Um, may it be uh, visual work or literary pieces like poetry and songs. And for us who are already involved in the movement, um, I encourage na wag tayo mawala ng... Uh, Nang, nang pasensya, and uh, we shouldn't get tired of inviting our family, our relatives, our friends to join our movement. So, yun. Salamat. Thank you, Ms. Castro, ma'am. And for the next question, this is for Ms. Kiri and uh, Mr. Villafranca. What are the guiding principles, ethics, in documenting disasters and marginalized communities? How do we make sure that we do no harm and have proper representation? presentation of the narratives of the victims and maybe uh, follow up to that question bilang artist po how can we help victims of disasters and groups vulnerable to climate change and welcome them to the environmental movement maybe sir jerome and sir kelvin can add on this also sige po miss miss kiriman um, um hi um thank you for that question well I would say that uh, th this is really uh, something that uh, all of us artists and filmmakers need to to take to heart, like doing no harm to the communities and the people we are engaging with. And um, I would say, for example, that being like having mentors, mentors with experience would be good, especially if if you have no um, access, for example, to to, to academic studies, you know, studying ethics formally through uh, journalism. Um, this is something that you really need to, to do because um, the worst thing that can happen is instead of, of alleviating or giving, giving 
genuine help to to these already vulnerable communities is is you uh, you bring more more harm just for the sake of art for the sake of film and uh, this is this is uh, but there is a long history of, of filmmakers and artists who have done difficult work in difficult situations and this is why you really need to connect to communities community of artists academics and be guided accordingly yes Yon. maraming salamat po uh, mr villa franca sir maybe you want to add uh yeah sir Kiri put it uh, very um, precisely. And, and just to add to that, um, it's also important to you know, know the basics of, for example, you're doing documentary work, either pho photographs or video. Um, it's uh, very important to know the, the ethics and the, the guidelines, um, basic principles, which is uh, fact checking, um, and make sure that you have a proper uh, coordination with the local community, um, most especially. Um, if you're starting out, pa lang. Um, if if you are already, let's say, uh, an early practitioner, um, it is important um, to to always keep yourself informed of how um, certain um, reports or artist work or exhibitions and so on are done. Um, and most and lastly, I think uh, one of the important responsibilities for us artists, photographers, and whatnot is also to, to share as much as we can, to share the work that we've done as much as we can. Try uh, to, to reach out to different platforms. Try to get your work published. Um, it's a very daunting task, but um, there are ways, um, especially today in the digital realm. And there are a lot of ways, including this um, forum. That's it. Maraming salamat, Mr. Villafranca. For next question, I, I believe this is uh, very good for Sir Jerome and Sir Kelvin, can you give a simple example on how the youth will contribute and make an impact to our environment, not just to the environment, but as well as to the whole country, now, especially in the time of pandemic that we all know our actions are limited due to the protocols. So can we hear from Jerome all and right. Kelvin, sir? All right. Thank Go you ahead. so much for that question, Po. Um, I think... Um, um uh iba iba tayo ng kakayahan uh, in in a sense that uh may mga artists may mga um born leaders may mga doers may mga followers but of course we all we also have to check on ourselves kung ano ba yung kaya natin us um filmmakers and as educators what we do is that we create films to you know to share stories that uh, could um inspire or could um, uh, send a message across uh, nations. Uh, others may also create, um, like um, um, in this kind of pandemic, especially, ma medyo mahirap yung ating um, uh, uh, ano to? Yung, uh, funds. Uh, mm -hmm. What we can also do is that we, um, uh, we join other organizations to you know um uh, get or give um support to our cause like for example in the um in the in our community we also have so, uh civil so uh, society organizations that are uh, engaging in this kind of uh, activities like for example um capacity building with um uh, youth leaders about climate change. So we can also engage ourselves with that. Sometimes the youth, um, hindi nila alam kasi kung saan sila um, lalapit when they have this desire to, you know, to create change and to um, volunteer themselves. Sometimes you have to um, know also where to go. Kung para mas ma, mas ma tulungan ka. Hindi kasi mahirap din kasi na ikaw lang mag-isa that you are doing all by your the efforts all by yourself. It's impossible to uh, create an, a huge impact in the society. So I think um to ask help is what yeah. really um could make, create a uh, impact, big impact in this time of pandemic. Okay, salamat Kelvin. Is Jerome there? Uh baka gusto niya pong magdagdag. Um, sir, medyo... Okay, sige po. Ano po Thank you. Po. Now, uh, for this question, uh, Dr. Rodel, last call, sir. Uh, since you are on research, 
Uh, the question is, since market food waste are contributing to GHGs, no greenhouse uh, emission, and uh, it's a an, an enormous problem to most of the LGUs. Uh, please share some doable solution to curb global warming, targeting the reduction of market food waste, uh, or making it useful for urban and rural farming. Okay. Yes, uh, that's very true. No, uh, waste is one of the biggest problems, primarily because because if they don't dispose of waste properly, they uh, contribute to methane, CH4 emissions, which is 20 times more powerful than a CO2 molecule. There are practical solutions. About half of our wastes are you know, basically food. They can be uh, uh, you know, backyard composting is an uh, option, especially for us living in rural areas. That's what we do here at home so that we uh, only uh, uh, dispose of uh, recyclable materials uh, that can be uh, further recycled. So uh, I think uh, uh, following those uh, simple uh, sort of uh, practices, even in our homes, uh, can help uh, here. And uh, that's what we need to do. We need to start from our households and uh, therefore uh, help in mitigating climate change. Thanks. Uh, thank you. For, for maraming, salamat po. maraming salamat po, Dr. Lasco. For one last question, alam ko pong marami tayong tanong, no? But uh, these questions probably for all the artists and the youth na gumagawa po ng mga visuals and films, no? Aside from visuals and films which are, are probably be an effective in communicating climate change action, are there specific forms of arts that can specifically help no, in reducing the climate change adaptation and also climate change mitigation. So anyone from our experts? Ma'am Kiri, maybe you want to, to do the initial answer for. Um, other forms uh, yes, outside well. of film? Um, I would say that, for example, now, uh, because of the limitations with um, COVID, that we could not, we could not really go out, you know, to, to protect ourselves and others. Uh, I turned, for example, to to writing again or to uh, to writing. Um, mm -hmm. So there are, uh, as artists, we also have to be to be resilient and to be malleable in in what what tools to use. So, so there, writing um, is one, poetry. I would say that, uh, so th that is like one of the most basic um, forms that, that we could do. Uh, I am certain that it, it's just so difficult now. Um, yes. uh, the limitations for artists, uh, mentally, psychologically, financially, we're exhausted, but then, I think collaborations or discussions about what we can also do through uh, online or through our communities would be great. You know, collaborating and finding out these new forms um, and discovering would we would be good. Okay, Mr. Benilla Franca, maybe you want to add some answer for. Again, I just want to add uh, from what Kiri said. Um, Maybe the best is also yeah collaboration because um, maybe there are some people who are more let's say capable of going outside and photographing or filming um, and then other people are limited to let's say their conf the confines of their houses um, so kung ano yung pwedeng may contribute and also I think one important sort of uh, discipline I think to cultivate also is uh, yung critical um, Yung critique natin, yung pagtingin natin sa images, pagtingin natin sa mga pelikula, pag, uh, pag, um, pagtanggap natin ng mga tula and so on. Kung anong mga creative fields yung nakikita natin online. Or kailangan maging mapanuri tayo and uh, I think it has to cover, uh, yun nga, going back to the earlier topic, kung ano ba talaga yung kailangan matutunan tungkol dun sa mga nangyayari sa, sa about the subjects, the communities who are affected by it. Uh, extreme weather conditions and also moving forward like what are the ways of uh, like for example the field of science that we can uh, 
um, uh, discuss in a creative manner. Um, maybe um, I should I should I would also like to, to add. Um, for example, animation animation is is amazing. Um, like well, what they what Kelvin has been doing. Uh, like last year, I was doing a documentary which had to be cut short because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We were locked in, and this is why I resorted to animating drawings of of the children. And so this is what I mean by being you know cre also creative in in the materials um, and now that that you mention it I, I do remember as well that a lot of artists are turning to working with found footage or archival material and transforming them to tell very new and contemporary um, issues or stories so these are just many of the forms that we can we can use and play with thank you Maraming, sal maraming salamat po, Ma'am Kiri. I can feel your passion, no? Okay, actually, we receive a lot of questions, no? From the attendees, participants, no? Of this webinar, no? But, but again, due to the limitations of time, sorry po, we have to end this open forum. Or maybe we can expect another round, no? Of this webinar. But with this, maraming salamat po with our resource persons, experts, no? To all your valuable responses. And thank you, of course, no, for all the attendees and participants, no, for sending your questions, critical questions, no, to make the discussions uh, in this webinar uh, more of a platform of learning. Okay, salamat po. Back to you, Dr. Amparo. Thank you very much, Dr. Willie. Ayan po. Um, uh, Dr. Willie is right, no, actually this is uh, saved in the DSDS FB page and the UPLB YouTube page. So if you have some additional comments that we could uh, address too, just type it there and we'll try to address that. Meron na po mga nag-request po ng mga book nila Sir VJ, film nila uh, Makiri, the research of uh, OML to Dr. Rodel, and of course yung, film, yung our, our, our World, the film. No? So um, we'll discuss that further as we go along. This is just phase one. Uh, uh, Doc Dino will discuss this in the closing remarks. But siguro po, um, before we end, formally end, we'd like to remind everyone that there's an evaluation form for the webinar. And thank you very much for staying with us. Medyo nag-extend lang po tayo ng konti. But the uh, evaluation form, once you answer it, it submit automatic po yung e-certificate of participation po para sa inyo. So thank you very much for joining us. So with that, we'd like to, um, before we do the formal closing uh, of the webinar, we'd like to encourage everyone to please, uh, this is the time to open our videos. We'll have a group photo, hopefully kaya po ng, <laughs> ng time. Uh, I don't know if how many panels do we have. So um, we'd like to engage everyone to open their videos for a quick uh, photo po. Of course, thank you to Dr. Rodel, to Ms. Nazrin, to Sir BJ, Ms. Kiri, Sir Jerome, and Sir Kelvin for our resource speaker. And also to our partners po. Ayan po. So is Sir Jillian or Sir Ron will take the photo? Uh, sure po, ma'am. Bani po, ma'am, yung mga panelists lang po pala makukuha ng photo yung mga participants po natin na hindi makikita sa screen. Ay, okay. So sige po. Right. All right, uh, one formal shot. Okay, one, two, three. Uh, one more pull it. One, two, three. Take a long point. Okay. Paste it on four. And uh, another. Another walking shot po naman. Ayan. Happy shot. Happy shot. <laughs> one, two, three. All right, salamat po. All right, thank you very much, Sir Jillian, uh, for that. Okay, so with that, I will have the closing remarks by Prof. Dino. So I'll share my screen. Sorry about that. I'll share again. Sorry. 
Let's see. Share song, yes. Our last call, Miss uh, Nazreen Camille De Castro, Sir Vijay Villafranca, Miss Kiri Belena, and uh, Sir Jerome Pineda and Sir Kelvin Aguilar for sharing their experiences and expertise with regards to uh, climate change and the localized, uh, the corresponding solutions. Let me also recognize our partners. Um, the APRU Secretary General, Dr. Chris Tremewan, and Ms. Jackie Wong as the Director of APRU Networks Program, Barn College and the Solve Climate by 2030 Coordinator, Dr. Ivan Goldstein, our uh, Chancellor, Dr. Jose Camacho, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Cincha Bautista, and our Dean, Dr. Ricardo M. Sandalo. This webinar features local cases and initiatives that engage both the rigors of scientific discipline and inspiring creativity of the arts for climate solutions. We envision that through this topic, we could reach out not only to formal educators and learners, but also with community development workers and professionals with their partner communities. This is primarily because to expand the discussion and support at the local level on climate solution and actions. Additionally, I uh, would like to reiterate that Oops, sorry. We envision that through this topic, we could reach out not only to formal educators and learners, but also with community development workers and professionals with their partner communities. This is primarily because to expand the discussion and support at the local level on climate solution and actions. Additionally, I uh, would like to reiterate that this is just the first phase of the partnership with APRU and Bard College for the Save the Climate by 2030 campaign. The second phase focuses more on developing and promoting these videos and webinars to be used by the K-12 and the tertiary institutions in their respective classes. So we're happy that uh, Rex Publishing Incorporated is, is, is already in the loop. So we hope to collaborate and sustain this initiative through this kind of partnership. And we invite other key stakeholders to join us uh, as we continue to be part of promoting the Save the Climate by 2030 campaign. So once again, thank you very much and uh, keep safe. Okay, so with that, maraming salamat po. Isa makakalikasang hapon. Maraming salamat po to APRU, Bard College, the DSDS CHE, uh, UPLB, Oscar M. Lopez, the Climate Reality Project, Aquarian Eye Media, and of course, Rex Publishing Incorporated. And we'd like to thank, of course, our resource speaker, our esteemed resource speakers here, uh, Dr. Lasco, Sir DJ, Sir Keith Mamkiri, Ms. Nazarene or Nazca, and also Sir Jerome and Sir Kelvin. In behalf of the Department of Social Development Services, College of Human Ecology, UP Los Baños, isang makakalikasang hapon po sa ating lahat. Maraming salamat po. Congrats po. Salamat po. Maraming salamat. Salamat, salamat po. po. Congratulations. Salamat Congrats po. Salamat po. Salamat po. Congrats po. We sent po the edited video to all our participants and also to our resource speakers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Keep safe. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kiri. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank